Well, hey there, I'm Josh Ellis, the Chief Executive Angel at SavingsAngel.com, and welcome to the Savings Angel Show. I'm broadcasting to you on a very warm day in Orlando, Florida. It's going to be 95 today. Now, I'm an extremely busy consumer expert, money-saving advocate, syndicated newspaper columnist, and a guy that turns digital entrepreneurs into media celebrities at UpMyInfluence.com. I love what I do, and I can't wait to get going on today's very special episode. Today, episode number 249 is the state of coupons and couponing for 2019. And I've got Bill Wonder from Coupons in the News to join us. The entire show is my conversation with Bill because Bill knows more about coupons and couponing than about anybody else I know. Runs a very successful blog, has a very successful newsletter that he uh, that I read diligently. So here we go with my conversation with Bill Wunner from Coupons in the News. And Bill Wunner, you are the founder of Coupons in the News. I got to say, it is so awesome being able to talk with you. I've been following your work for, well, since the beginning. Basically, I probably found out about your blog, your website, and your your email newsletter, uh, I'm sure easily within the first month of it going live, uh, just because you've been actually, what you do is, I mean, you actually do great reporting on uh, on the coupon industry and, and things happening in and around coupons, everything from, you know, fraudsters, which those are always fun reads, to uh, innovation technology. So I just want to say, Bill, thank you so much for joining me. Well, thanks for having me. Great to talk to you. Give me a little history lesson on uh, first off, first off your blog and like why you started, when you started, and and what your mission is. Um, the coupons in the news started in about uh, 2012. I started it because you know, like a lot of things, when you see a need and nobody's doing it, the best way to address the need is to do it yourself. Mm. You know, I found that at that time. There were tons of coupon blogs that were sharing information about how to save money, what's on sale, what coupon to use, but there, there, there wasn't kind of the depth uh, and the coverage of the industry, like changes and, and new things that were coming, to, uh, you know, coming down the pike. There was a lot of interest by the mainstream media in couponing you know, uh, at that time, but they didn't really understand couponing. They didn't know the lingo. They didn't really know how it worked. So there needed to be a middle ground. There needed to be, you know, coverage of coupons as an industry and, and what was developing uh, for a consumer audience and, and telling them, you know, what's in it for them. And so if we go even further back, where, where did coupons come from and, and why do we have them? <laughs> well, uh, you know, if you look back at the the history of coupons, I think it started with uh, Coca Cola back in the uh, the late eighteen hundreds issued the very first coupon. Uh, you know, then it was uh, Grape Nuts, I think, in the early nineteen hundreds that issued the first grocery coupon. Um, they didn't change a whole lot until relatively recently, when you've had you know online coupons and coupons on your phone and and you know all different kinds of coupons available now. But uh, you know, the idea being that manufacturers issue coupons so that you go out and try their products. If you like their product, then maybe next time you'll buy it without a coupon. So the the real difference I think nowadays is that people have learned to use coupons strategically, not just cutting it out, using it on a product and doing as the brand might want you to do and buy it at full price next time. People have learned to time the sales cycles and hold on to their coupons when they can use them most effectively. So that's where the industry and the use of coupons really becomes interesting, I think. Yeah. So, and I think with the advent of the internet, how, I mean, you look at, you know, late 1800s all the way up until the 90s, late 90s, coupons really didn't change a whole lot. Maybe the value changed. Maybe there was some different distribution platforms in terms of, you know, maybe they were, more so in magazines or less in magazines, but certainly I think the mainstay for coupon distribution is the Sunday paper. And, uh, and that's been quite an evolution since the internet. So why, uh, I wonder why the Sunday paper, like how that became a thing. That kind of became a thing in the, in the early 70s. Before then, 
you know, if anybody's been around that long, uh, you know, coupons used to be printed in the newspaper itself, or mm. they might uh, be sent through the mail, or they might be, you might remember this, uh, you know, cutting them out of the, the cardboard packages on the, on the cereal boxes you yeah. would get, things like that. But uh, it was in the early 70s, they started distributing them in the newspaper along with the advertising inserts. So it, they became much more accessible. Uh, you know, you're not ripping apart packages to get to coupons anymore. So, you know, the, the, the interest and the use of coupons certainly increased at that time because there it was on your doorstep every Sunday. So is it my imagination or have coupon values really gone up? I, I think is interesting because when, when we first started into this journey and we had to, out of necessity, uh, I thought, you know, I, I started to re- I read a stack of books on how to save money at the grocery store. And, uh, you know, when I first heard about coupons, I think I had the, the same initial reaction that a lot of other people do that they're not really into it. They're like, I'm going to do all this work and I'm going to save a nickel. I mean, what's the point in that? Um, but coupon values, uh, you know, today's coupons are not your mother's coupons from the 70s. Yeah. If you if you look at old coupons, you can search online for vintage coupons. You'll yep. see, you know, 10 cents off, you know, 7 cents off, <laughs> you know, very specific low values like that, which, you know, relative to the prices of the products back then were decent. But, you know, nowadays, certainly with prices going up, the values of the coupons have gone up. You know, it's it's very easy to find coupons for a dollar, two dollars, or more. So mm. you're not just saving pennies and nickels that can really have an impact on your budget. And do you uh, recall, or do you know, like uh, as the internet becomes more prevalent, more people are spending more time on websites, on you know, blogs before they were called blogs. Uh, but how how did that impact initially? Uh, the use of uh, manufacturers' incentives or coupons. Do you do you have any idea, like who the first person to or the first company to make uh, digital coupons available? Who that was? Um, I'm not completely up on the history. I know it was you know in the in, it was in the 90s. It was in the late 90s that the first you know printed coup, printed home coupons started to appear. Mm. And, uh, they used to be very basic. PDF, I'm sure PDFs were probably the first, and then uh, that probably uh, you, you don't see too many PDFs today. Uh, yeah, exactly. I mean, the yeah, coupon, there's some problems with that. It print. You know, it yeah, as easy as that. Yeah. So just so, so somebody who hasn't added two and two on that. Uh, so um, so security is is something that is a concern for manufacturers because I think. Well, talk about the what is the intention of, of 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 a manufacturer providing a coupon? What what's the behavior that they're trying to get consumers to do? Well, what the manufacturer is trying to do is to get you to buy their product, and yeah. you know the same as putting a putting a product on sale, they issue a coupon to try to incentivize you, try to tempt you with a discount to try their product. And mm. if you like their product, uh, maybe you'll become a full price paying customer in the future. But I think a lot of uh, a lot of shoppers and a lot of couponers have learned to kind of work the system, make it work yeah. for them. You know, waiting until an item is on sale, waiting until they can use a coupon when the item is on sale. You know, getting something for the lowest price. It's not necessarily what the brand might want you to do. You know, they're not making the most amount of money by you doing that, but you are buying their product. So, you know, it's it's whether it's a win-win for both or whether one is taking uh, you know better advantage of the the system than the other. You know. Uh, Somebody wins in the end. So I wonder, you know, so you have sales and then you have coupons. I wonder if one works better than the other. Why do they have to do both? Um, it's just different methods of reaching different uh, different shoppers. Some people aren't inclined to cut out coupons or, or clip them on their phones. They'd rather just go to the store that has the lowest prices. They might go to a store that that has no sales, like uh, Walmart or Aldi or places like that. Or they might like to go to a store that has a lot of different items on sale every week. Or they might like to clip coupons and do that. So they're just different ways of reaching different people, depending on what uh, what type of discount appeals to them. Mm. And so looking then at uh, 2011, 2012, uh, so with extreme couponing, can you kind of give us a... Uh, 
uh, kind of explain what happened there with kind of this perfect storm of the economy, this TV show, and you know the you know, everybody and their mother becoming a coupon blogger. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you can, you can track the use of coupons along with the economy. Every time the economy takes a dip, coupon use skyrockets, and that's mm-hmm. happened historically, you know, uh, several times before in the past. So that happened again, uh, you know, around that time, 2010, 11, 12, uh, coupon use became very prevalent because of the economy at that time. Uh, And that's also when this extreme couponing TV show started, which, uh, you know, a lot of people might remember. You might still see it now because the reruns are on, you know, (laughs) all over the place. Mm -hmm. But uh, that, you know, like any reality tv it's it's not completely reality you know a lot of it was uh was you know stepped up for the cameras but it really kind of brought the the practice of couponing into the mainstream suddenly people started to pay attention this wasn't an underground little thing that you you know did in your in your spare time you know everybody started paying attention to this so the few blogs that existed at the time were joined by many many others yeah you know, everybody was jumping on board with uh, with uh, couponing blogs, trying to explain how to do this. Uh, at the same time, the the mainstream media started paying paying attention to this and doing more stories about this this weird culture of couponing, <laughs> trying to explain what was going on. So that's when things really started to change. People started to pay attention and and try to use coupons effectively. And uh, in some cases, you know, abusing coupons. And that's yeah. when kind of the, the back and forth between how far can you go and how far will the brands let you go? And that push and pull has been around ever since. Yeah. So uh, one thing that, that I, I actually quite enjoy on, on your website, so couponsinthenews.com, and, and I, you know, I love getting the emails as well, is that you cover a lot of uh, coupon fraud stories. And so coupon fraud has been, I mean, it's, I, I think it's probably as long as there's been coupons, there's people that are looking to game the system on that. Is, is coupon fraud something that's a fairly easy crime to get into? Um, it can be if you don't, if you don't understand how, how it works and how the rules work. I mean, a lot of people may be committing coupon fraud and not even know it. You know, we talked about the old you know, PDF coupons on the screen and printing it out. Yeah. People might not know that if, you know, if you see something like that, it's, it's, you can't print off 100 copies and use all of them. It's really meant to be just one. But in the absence of rules, sometimes people just make up their own rules, whether it's <laughs> innocently or not. Um, but, of course, there are people who do it less than innocently. They, yeah. They've found ways to game the system, to get a hold of extra coupons, uh, you know, stealing coupons out of newspapers that are in the rack, things like that. So it's, you know, it's, it's become more tempting, I think, uh, yeah. you know, with, with the rise of couponing. Why should I only get one copy of the inserts in my Sunday paper when I can go out and steal some more or buy them online or print off multiple copies of coupons when I'm only supposed to get one or two? Right. So I, you know, the, the temptation is certainly there, but you know, the, the fraud, whether it's in the form of stealing coupons or even creating your own coupons, people have yeah. learned to create their own barcodes that will actually scan correctly at the store. So, you know, depending on the abilities of the, the people doing it, you know, coupon fraud has always been a problem and, and may continue to be. And so if somebody, let's say someone um, prints out a coupon and then they put it in the photocopier and they make 40 copies and uh, they bring it in because they know that they're, it, it's going to end up being a really good deal for them. That's a crime, right? Yeah. yeah so <laughs> it, it, it just for, for clarity's sake, uh, can, can you help uh, the person who's listening to this understand that you know, why you actually can't do that. Why that, you know, why is that a crime? That's just taking advantage of a system, right? It's, but it's not. And, and can you kind of explain like how that, how the law factors into that? I mean, without giving a lawyerly answer, just from, <laughs> from your perspective as an observer of the industry and what you've seen, I suppose. Yeah. I mean, it, it's considered counterfeiting. It's considered fraud. It's considered uh, even a copyright violation at, at times. You know, when the when the brand offers a coupon, when you go to a, a website to print it, a lot of times, if you're not reading the fine print, you're agreeing to their terms and conditions of mm-hmm. providing that coupon to you. 
And in their terms and conditions, they might say, you know, one coupon or two coupons per person. And if you photocopy them, then you're violating those terms. And, you know, you're not abiding by the, the rules that you supposedly agreed to when you printed that coupon. And nowadays, the, the companies have processes in place where they can track the coupons. They know who printed it from what computer and what location. And not only can you get in trouble with the law for something like this, but they can find you and they can block you from ever printing coupons again. So you really yeah. do so at your own risk in a number of ways. Yeah. And then um, it just in practical terms, I think what ends up happening then, I wonder when somebody actually, like how they actually get intercepted with law enforcement it's probably going to be at the store unless, you know, they're involved in some sort of a racketeering thing, you know, where they're, you know, distributing, you know, clipping services. Well, I want, I want to ask you about that in just a second, but um, so someone, so what will happen is now, you know, if you're involved in sourcing that coupon, you're, you're tied to information in the barcode. You do something you're not supposed to, now, anything attached to that coupon, you try and scan that in the future, and retailers, uh, it's built into the system where if they scan it, uh, you can actually be on the naughty list, and retailers have a protocol that they follow if they scan someone, you're on the naughty list, you get, uh, you get invited to the uh, little side room in the front of the store there and wait for law enforcement to show up. That's what happens, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. There, there have been some pretty notable cases of coupon fraud. <laughs> There's probably someone who's like, I don't really care about this. I just want to know how to save money using coupons. But I'm like fascinated <laughs> with this. Um, what are some of the notable uh, uh, coupon fraudsters maybe over the past number of years? There are people that are in prison today. Uh, yeah. Just in case anyone thinks that this is some little silly uh, slap on the wrist crime, mm, the, the, peop the people with some, some big, big prison time as a result of what they've done. Yeah, uh, you know, any form of coupon you can think of, it's probably been counterfeited. And there are you know, pretty good examples of fraud that occurred and people who have gotten in trouble for that, depending on what type of coupon we're talking about. Um, when you talk about uh, printable coupons at home, there were people who figured out a way to create coupons that look exactly like the real thing. They you know, came up with barcodes. And uh, there were a couple of people online who distributed uh, how-to guides on how to make your yeah. own coupons and how to yep. make your own barcodes. And this would happen underground online on, on in chat, chat rooms and boards and things like that. And that's much more difficult to track those people down when it's one person sharing this with people yeah. all over the internet. It's not just one person being pulled aside at the store and, you know, people have sort of deniability. They were able to say, Oh, I just found this online. I didn't know mm. there was anything wrong with it. So that really spread. And that was very difficult to track down, but they did eventually find the people who were doing this. And, you know, there are individuals who've, who've served time, who've been in jail for this. Yeah. Uh, at the same time, you think of a, a physical coupon that you might get in the mail or in the in the newspaper. Uh, there are people who have managed to, you know, fire up the printing presses, get professional publishers to create coupons like this. So it's not a it's not an amateur looking printed home coupon, but a very real looking coupon. Uh, there are some ladies uh, in Phoenix in uh, 2012, oh, yeah. which was probably one of the most uh, notorious uh, cases in recent memory, who were uh, getting these coupons made by the, by the hundreds, by the thousands, and selling them out of their home, yeah. uh, advertising on the, on the internet. You know, people would uh, place their orders, get their coupons in the mail, and, and go to the store all over the country using these things. So again, you know, having to track this down with all these coupons showing up in all these different places, but once they found them, you know, they, uh, at least the, the ringleader, did prison time. And uh, they're still, to this day, paying back uh, a good portion of the money that they defrauded. And mm. that's something they're going to be paying back for a very long time. So quick economics lesson here. Uh, some people will say, well, this is, this is a pretty victimless crime, and I'm just sticking it to the man. 
Yeah, that's, and that's that's part of the challenge in fighting coupon fraud. It, it's been around for so long, and and there are so many cases like this, and there are certainly cases where people have paid a, a severe penalty, but there is that attitude of you know, I'm not really doing anything wrong or saying, oh, I didn't know it was wrong, you know, have some leniency on me. And and even brands sometimes are reluctant to go after people who they think, oh, you know, they're just they're just a mom trying to save money. Do we really want to look like the bad guys publicly, you know, going after the the poor coupon clipping mom? So there's a reluctance to to pursue certain cases. So it's a difficult problem. I mean, it costs brands, you know, tens, hundreds of millions of dollars a year. Mm. But, uh, you know, they really have to you know, keep up with it and go after the people who are, who are ruining, it for their, ruining it for everybody else. Yeah. And, Bill, that, I think that's the big point. And, uh, you know, in terms of people thinking that, oh, well, if I do this, I'm not hurting anybody. I'm just these big, greedy com- you know, corporations. I- I'm just, you know, getting them to uh, – they're never going to miss it. It's a write-off for them. Here's the reality of it. You're not sticking it to the man. Uh, when you misuse or abuse couponing or or manipulate any savings opportunity what what happens is you ruin it for other people because if a program turns out to uh, end up costing a manufacturer retailer way too much money and their loss goes beyond what makes good business sense for them guess what? They're just not going to do that again. And we've seen, I mean, you know, over the years, we've seen some really amazing things come and go because people abused a really good opportunity. So sum up, you're not sticking it to the man. Who you're hurting is the single mom who who needs that high value coupon for Huggies diapers. That's who you're sticking it to. And that's where, uh, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, people who misuse coupons, that that's what really, really gets me upset is people who don't add it up, that it's somehow just just magically going to make itself whole when you thieve. It, it impacts other people. Yeah. And when, you know, people might understand that theoretically and think, well, maybe that might happen in the future, but I need to save money now. But if you really look at the way coupons have changed over these past yeah. few years, there really is a very noticeable impact in the way things have changed. And that's a, a direct result of, of some of the fraud that's been going on. You know, there are a lot more restrictions on coupons now on what coupons you can use on what products and how many you know, those restrictions didn't exist, you know, eight, nine, 10 years ago. But since people, you know, abused coupons and, and created their own counterfeit coupons, you know, brands have really had to crack down and limit the amount of exposure they have to this, this you know, liability that's out there. Yeah. All right. So let's talk about, <laughs> let's, let's move on to saving money here. So uh, <laughs> we talked about all the ways you shouldn't do this, uh, just because we were totally geeking out on this. So. Today, in 2019, how does somebody use coupons today? Believe it or not, and if you don't follow coupons very closely, you might be surprised by this, but even if you do follow coupons closely, you might be surprised. But still, in this day and age, you would think that so many uh, coupons are online, on your phone, or digital, on the computer. 90% of all the coupons out there that are available are on paper, they're, uh, they're from the Sunday newspaper inserts. It's unreal. That's um, unbelievable. That's pretty antiquated. A lot of people don't even get the Sunday newspaper anymore. Right. But that's still by far the, the biggest distribution methods for coupons to get in, into the hands of consumers. You know, mm. Digital is certainly growing, but it's got a long way to go to catch up to this, you know, this legacy product that's been around for you know, decades and decades. Wow. Really, I think one of the, what what would you say would be the first steps if somebody says, look, Bill, I need to save money. And you're telling me that coupons could help me save money. So is the first step then that they just subscribe to the Sunday paper? That's the best way to do it. I think that's that's where the most coupons are, the, the easiest access. You know, anybody can subscribe to the paper or just drop by your local store and pick one up. And there, you know, you'll have dozens, hundreds of, of coupons right in front of you. 
Mm. Um, really the best way the, to learn the process of couponing is not just clip out what you want to use, throw away the rest and run to the store right away. You know, you, you need to build up a stash and, and have plenty of coupons available and keep an eye on the sales at your store and match those coupons to the items that are on sale. That's, that's really the most effective way to use coupons and, and to really have an impact on your budget. If I get the Sunday paper, uh, you're, you're telling me that coupons are available there. Like, how many? Wh- what do I look for? Um, help, help me identify what I would expect. Like, what kind of value? What kind of products? Yeah, it, it, it varies from week to week. You know, there are anywhere from two to three to four separate inserts uh, that are, are distributed each Sunday um, for any brand you can think of, pretty much. I mean, usually, if not the exact product that you need to buy, you know, the, the some brand of some product that everybody needs around their house, whether it's food or household supplies, there's a coupon available for it. So you just have to look out for the ones you think you'll use, look out for the ones that maybe will incentivize you to use something that, uh, that you wouldn't ordinarily. You know, the values are certainly much more nowadays than they, than they were back in the old days. You know, a, a single coupon can be worth one, two, three dollars or more. So yeah. it, it can really have an impact. You're not talking, you know, pennies and nickels. So how much money do you think someone, okay. So also let's cover this too. Um, let's say you see a, a Huggies coupon. Should you run out and use it right away? Well, the best thing to do is to compare prices just like you would without coupons. If you take coupons out of the equation, you look for the store that has the best price on the product Mm -hmm. that you want to buy, whether it's the regular price, whether it's a sale price. And then you take that coupon and you try to match it with the store that has the lowest price. And if nobody has a great price this week, then hold on to the coupon. Try next week. See if that works. You know, so it's, it's, it's easy to cut out a coupon and run to the store and use it. But it can be easy to become frustrated that way. You know, when I started couponing, I would see these websites and these books, how to use coupons. And I thought, why do you need to know how to use a coupon? You cut it out. (laughs) But you learn that there's a process to this. There's there's a best way to do it. And, you know, you don't have to become an extreme couponer on day one. You know, there are ways to learn the process and ways to save money, ways to save more without Mm -hmm. spending all of your free time doing it. Like with anything, the the more time you put into it, the more you'll probably benefit. But that doesn't mean you have to go all out right away. So uh, speaking of extreme couponing and saving money, I mean, what what can people expect? If they start uh, using coupons, are they going to be able to fill their garage with toothpaste and mustard and get for like a nickel? or Because <laughs> that's what we saw on TV, Bill. <laughs> Yeah, and everything you see on TV is real, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, and it's really interesting. Just reality check. I've talked about this before, but there, those of us who understood the math recognized that there, there was a lot of fiction on the show. And there were store policies that were, uh, you know, they, they did stuff that they just don't do for normal people yeah. because we knew the policies they were taking advantage of. You know, let's say you, you, um, you know, you show up and, uh, you know, you've, you've bankrolled, you know, $50 worth of register rewards. Well, yeah, you know, you're going <laughs> to, you know, you're, you're at the end of the day, you're going to show saving a lot of money. But what they don't show is that for months, you've been bankrolling these register rewards that you're going to cash in and, uh, and redeem in, in one sitting. So in reality, it's, it's, I found that it's really tough even if you're doing this really, really well, I mean, you could buy certain product lines and, and yes, you're going to save a lot of money. But I mean, for the things that most people buy, it's really tough to save, I would say more than like, say, 75%. 50% is easy. That's really easy. But I mean, when you, anything beyond 50, especially 75% savings and on, that's where you, you know, you're, that's, it's like that final 10 yards. It's, it's, it gets, you end up expending way too much time. I think beyond that level where your time per hour really starts to go down in terms of just how much money you can save. That said, you can get free stuff 
And can you still get free things on? I, I, I haven't been uh, getting the freebies as much as I used to. Can you still get free things with coupons? You can still get free things. It's it's a lot harder than it used to be, and you may not get a, a garage full all at the same <laughs> time. But, uh, you know, if you play your cards right and you match your coupons with sales, you can still get items for free. But uh, it's more of a it's more of a bonus now than an expectation. Mm. What what do you think would be typical? Like if so, so let's say somebody, uh, if you were to say, look, here's my best advice. You know, someone's like, Bill, right now my family and I are spending, we were shocked, but we're spending about, let's say $900 at the grocery store and another $400 eating out every month. What should we do? Really the best way, I mean, again, if you take coupons out of the equation, if you go to a store that's having a buy one, get one free sale and you buy those items, you've saved 50% right there, yeah, which is a significant savings and can really have an impact on your budget. If you add coupons and layer that on top of that, then you get into the 60, 70, 75% range. And that's yeah. where it really makes a noticeable impact. So you just have to learn over time, you know, what coupons are available and also what items are on sale. A lot of people advise, you know, keeping an eye on your grocery circulars and you'll start to notice a pattern, the same items tend to go on sale every six to eight weeks or so. So you don't need to get a garage full of items, but if you can get enough to tide you over to that next sale cycle, then you'll never have to pay a full price, full price for those items. Awesome. All right. So where, where do you think we go from here in terms of uh, coupons? Are they going to continue to, because they have declined in, in popularity since say 2012. Uh, there was a big sugar rush, a big spike of, of consumer interest. And then, you know, what we saw at Savings Angel, because we, we provided a membership website uh, for a number of years and, uh, you know, we helped a lot of good people. Uh, but then, you know, interest continued to wane and wane. You know, we uh, closed down that portion and just kind of became a traditional blog. Uh, and uh, uh, in the uh, grocery game shut down. And then a new one, not a new one, but uh, uh, there was just another service uh, that shut down. And, and can you tell us about that? I mean, in terms of what we're talking about is our matchups. Now, there are still matchups that are available provided by individual blogs. And a matchup, can you explain what a matchup is? Yeah, a matchup is when you, when you go on blogs that follow certain stores closely, they will run down a list of everything that's on sale at the store that week, and they will tell you what coupons to match up with those items that are on sale. So rather than going with a whole stack of coupons and using whatever you get to that week, or just going by the grocery circular, it's matching the coupons you have or the coupons that are available with the items that are on sale at the store. And just FYI, it's very labor intensive to produce. If you want to like index everything that's in a store circular every week. I mean, at one point, Bill, we had over 50 employees. Wow. I mean, it was that big of, I mean, we had a lot of stores that we were doing, but when it started, Savings Angel started, it was just my wife and I, and I would do Meyer and Walgreens. And then my wife would do CVS and Family Fair. So this was started up in West Michigan. And I would spend 12 hours. There were some other things that were rolled into there, but yeah, 12 hours on Sunday and 12 hours on Monday. Yeah. And, uh, and then we'd have that ready by Tuesday morning for, for our readers but yeah, eventually, uh, I think consumers, why, why have consumers lost interest, do you think? Or not lost, but the interest has declined quite a bit. Um, a number of factors. I mean, anytime the, the economy gets better, you know, interest in couponing declines, and that's happened historically. You know, the economy gets bad, coupon use goes up and vice versa. Mm. But it's a combination of that and the kind of the backlash or the reaction to the extreme couponing. There's yeah. so many more restrictions now on coupon use, you know, stores have restrictive policies on how many coupons on what particular items you can use. So a lot of people, some people might think their economic situation is better. They don't need to use coupons as much as they did anymore. Other people who might benefit from coupons are so frustrated at all the rules and restrictions. They've kind of thrown up their hands and said, forget it. I'm just going to go to Walmart where you don't have to use coupons to save money. Uh, so it, there, there's always that give and take, that push and pull between what consumers want and what the brands want. And when coupon use increases too much and brands are spending too much money redeeming or, you know, redeeming those coupons, they kind of put on the brakes, put it, put some more restrictions in place, maybe issue fewer coupons, issue lower value coupons. So they've 
successfully hit the brakes in recent years and got you know coupon use down to a, a manageable level. But uh, you might argue they've they put on the brakes too much because coupon use has really declined to to very very low levels, historically low levels. We haven't seen the, this rate of low coupon use since the 1970s. So whether brands are going to step on the gas again to get people more interested, you know, that remains to be seen. But we'll we'll see how things work out in the coming years. I mean, people still love discounts, like, and uh, particularly buying something online or using your phone. I think the standard thing, at least I would hope, is that, you know, you're checking out and you see that little link that says promo code (laughs) and instantly you open up another tab and you search for a promo code. I mean, so people are still actively looking for ways to save money on the things they're buying. Yeah, and when, when we talk about low coupon levels, we're still talking billions and billions of coupons a year. So it's it's not like absolutely nobody uses coupons anymore. It's certainly down from its high, but uh, there are plenty of coupons out there, plenty of people still using them. And we're kind of in the shift now from the paper world to the digital world. You know, digital is certainly increasing where you have coupons, you know, on your phone you know, yep. that you can walk around with you at all times. You don't have to cut them out of the, the newspaper anymore if you don't want to. So yeah. we're we're kind of in the middle of that shift now. Whether paper coupons go away entirely in the future, you know, will see. But there there's certainly an increase in digital coupons. So as as coupons shift along with our habits, you know, we'll see whether that helps to uh, to increase the their popularity again. Yeah. Do you, Do you have any memorable like your your best coupon savings that you've ever uh, encountered? Can, do, you, do you have any that you remember? Um, or any particular I deals? <laughs> I mean, I personally never had the, the, the garage full of, of products of 97 bottles of mustard or anything like mm-hmm. that. <laughs> I mean, I think personally, I'm just happy to you know, be saving money. I think I was like you in the beginning where you go down the, the line items of your budget yeah. and you say, well, the mortgage, nothing I can do about that. You got to pay that. You got to pay this. You know, groceries, you got to pay that. But then I kind of took a second look and said, do I really need to be paying that? Is there some yeah. way to, to, to get that number down? And that's, that's really where it's helped. So, you know, it's, it's fun to get the big scores and to get the, the items for free. But yeah. on a long-term basis, it's really just saving money on a regular basis and cutting back on an expense that, that you really can tackle. Yeah, I love it. Where's your favorite place to shop when you, when you buy groceries? You're, you're in the Southeast, like me. Yes, yes. Um, usually Publix yeah. is, is my store of choice because, uh, you know, that's that's a great place that has uh, a lot of items on sale that you can really match up with coupons. Yep. Yeah, yeah, same same here. Well, good. Well, Bill, uh, so I want to make sure that everybody listening, please bookmark and get on Bill's email list so that you can have these stories sent to you. Uh, and that's coupons in the news dot com. Uh, great industry news. Uh, you send out coupons as well. Great savings opportunities. And uh, Bill, you've you've been a um, you've been a fixture now uh, in in the space. And so I appreciate all the great journalism that that you've done over the uh, past seven plus years in in this industry. I've learned a lot from you. I've certainly loved keeping up to date uh, with what's going on in the news. So thank you so much for all of your work. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. Now, if you enjoyed hearing everything on this podcast, please share this episode with a friend. People need this information. You and I together, we can change lives. I love it when people are just more aware of how they spend their money. They know all the tricks and, uh, they, you know, they've got that friend. That friend is me. And I'm the guy who knows how to get a deal hookup or upgrade on anything at, in life. And that's what we talk about on this podcast. So if you could take a screenshot, you know how you do that on your phone and then upload it to Facebook or wherever you hang out with most and say, friends, please listen to this episode. Good stuff from my buddy, Josh. (laughs) Now, as always, if you have any specific questions or if there's something you'd like to hear me talk about, you could drop a podcast in our podcast feedback. Just uh, email us over at Savings Angel. 
You can write to me on our Facebook group. Just when you're in Facebook, just search for Savings Angel, all one word, and you can join our private top secret group uh, where you can ask me questions and I'm there. I I will see everything that you post. Or you can call our podcast hotline right now at 407-205-9250 and leave me a message. I'll answer your question, write you back or with your permission. I might even share your question or story with others on this show. With that, have a wonderful week full of saving more, earning more, and living more abundantly. And thank you for listening. Number 249.